right, here we are, government operations on Friday. <coughs> and um, today we're going to talk about a couple different things. We're going to look more in depth. Uh, yesterday we had just an initial conversation about the um, quasi-judicial boards and how um, we need to have some special um, legislation around allowing them to meet bit virtually also. And then we're gonna continue that conversation. Then we're gonna hear of any other issues that are facing municipalities that haven't come up yet, that we haven't dealt with, that we might need to deal with. And I will tell you that I just got off a meeting with the Secretary of State and with uh, Sarah Copeland Hanses, and they have, I suspect that some of the issues that might come up today are around elections, whether that municipal elections, whether it's school boards or town budget, excuse me, town budgets, um, anything else. They have a, a draft of, a, of <clears throat> some guidance for towns to follow and as we got off the phone call about 10 minutes ago, Jason Malucci had sent over a, an advisory to the Secretary of State's office that the governor was pretty ready to sign off on it. So if they get that in a, in a final form, as opposed to a draft form before we're done today, they're gonna to send it to Gail to post on our website and um, there's, because there's a lot of, um, it'll answer a lot of questions about uh, local elections. <laughs> so with that, um, we, do we have Karen or Gwen? Yep. Okay, um. <laughs> do you wanna kick off the conversation here just around um, some of the issues and, and um, we'll hear from some of the local people Okay, can you hear me? This is Karen yes. Horn at the League of Cities and Towns. All right, I am giving my uh, neighbor's office a break today. That when when you can see me in my garden, then um, I'm at my neighbor's office. Oh. Uh, um, so yeah, there's a few, first of all, we wanna give you a huge thank you for all that you've done for us already because you your committee really has been front and center on helping municipalities uh, get the tools they need to get through this. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we do have a, sort of a never ending list of issues that arises. Um, one, one does have to do with the quasi-judicial boards, which you're already um, looking at. We did have questions about um, municipal elections and if uh, somebody is trying to get a question onto a ballot for a municipal election, are they still going to go out and um, need to get signatures on that petition? Um, we, we've looked at the guidance from property evaluation review, and I think that some of the questions that Representative Gannon maybe has um, been discussing in House GovOps are around um, inspections um, for uh, assessments and with respect to grievances. We are thinking that we'll get quite a few grievance, grievances um, this year. And then um, an issue that actually just came up um, in the last day, I'd say, is um, whether towns should are able to um, specify the way in which uh, property taxes should be paid. For instance, there's at least one town, maybe more, that are that don't want to accept cash at this point, and a lot of stores are also not accepting cash right now. But anyway, that's a, a question. So. I don't know if Gwen has other issues or other perspectives to add on to those, but that's sort of what we've come up with for the moment. Hi, and then, uh, this is Gwen Zakoff. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Keep go going, ahead, Karen. Gwen. 
I was just going to elaborate, Gwen Zach of, of VLCD for the record. Um, I was just going to elaborate on, on the BCA stuff. So I, I was uh, under the impression that the committee would be taking this up next week. So we can sort of hold off on some of those issues. But I think of all the issues that uh, we could, that the committee might talk about today, that might be the one that may be the most pressing in terms of needing sort of a legislative fix eventually. Um, in terms of the petitions that Karen had brought up, so uh, under the directive from the Secretary of State's office earlier, um, which has been incredibly helpful in terms of the getting the signatures, um, uh, the need for getting p signatures for petitions, um, the way we're reading it and we're hoping, you know, we're, we're trying to walk kind of a little bit of a tightrope here because it's not super explicit, um, but it uh, most likely does address the petitions for special meetings that voters, you know, would call for. What it doesn't appear to address are those petitions that are basically littered throughout statute um, that enable or empower citizens to gather signatures for sort of subject matter area issues. So those could be things like when a, a town is looking to sell property. I mean, a, a select board is, a, is um, uh, selling property um, they're under 24 VSA 1061. There's the ability for citizens to basically challenge that. There's also the ability for um, citizens to challenge or sorry, not to challenge, but to propose a charter um, under Chapter 17 or under Title 17. They can also do a, um, a, a challenging an ordinance or a rule that is put forward under Title 24. So there's a bunch of these that are sort of littered throughout statute. And what we've been telling our members so far, sort of in this like gray area, is to sort of use the judge, use your best judgment, and and, and um, if at all possible, don't make decisions as a select board or as a city council that would put you in that position of having to um, receive these petitions, whether it be selling property or adopting an ordinance or um, those sorts of things. Um, but it's a little bit, um, you know, that that can only hold true for so long because eventually they're going to have to make. Eventually, those actions are going to. Um, come about. Um, so that's just a, a, a greater clarification of what we um, have, have seen as sort of a, a gap in that um, the governor's and the secretary of state's order is not really expanding beyond local elections for special um, and annual meetings um, and not going uh, to the subject matter areas. So Gwen, I think you are right about um, thinking that we were going to go into much more detail on Tuesday about the issues. So what we're hoping today is to get them all out and to just get some general understanding of what some of the issues are. Am I right, committee? And then and then on Tuesday, because we won't have anything ready for, um, we're having a floor session on Monday. And what we will have from here on Monday is the property tax issue and the um, posting issue. Those are the two that we'll pass on Monday. And then I don't know if we'll have a floor session later in the week, but it'll be either later in the week or the beginning of the next week when we do the um, the elections and the quasi-judicial. So I think okay, you were great. right about that. Yeah. <coughs> so are there any questions for Gwen right now or Karen, Brian? Well, actually, Allison had her hand up first. Oh, I'm no, sorry. I, I, I didn't. I, I just wanted to say generally, I, I think that what what I'm interested in, and I and I thought we all were, was is in municipal issues that both need immediate fix. You know mm -hmm. that that are cropping up that we want to hear that need immediate fixes, but also uh, municipal issues that where this pandemic is creating uh, our understanding for opportunities for 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 the next phase of our work. You know, and and things that are, need legislative fixes, and things that may just need our support and a letter which reinforces the need for something. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, we're not at the point yet of taking up non-COVID issues. I mean, we can bring them up, but um, it's going to be a while before. And we have right. a whole list of them on here that we should right. be learning from. But you're right, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think I know the answer, but when Karen mentioned that there were municipalities that um, were preferring not to accept cash, I think I understand why I ordered a pizza at a local spot last night where they have to bring it out to your car 
and they won't make change. If you have, if the pizza is $15 and all you have is a 20, there's your $5 tip and that's the way it goes. Is it the same situation where people are afraid to actually handle money, uh, Karen? Yeah, that that is the concern right now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Could I offer just one other comment? This is Sean Fielder, the uh, manager for the town of Hardware, just on that particular yep. issue, Senator. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is, uh, we, we've got a, in, in the town of Hardwick, just as an example, we have about on a given cycle, about 125 of our customers do pay in cash. We have been talking to them about, look, if you're in a position to pay by check or money order, please do that. The other issue here that comes up is many people try to pay right on that day when it's due for the town of Hardwick, it would be uh, May 11th if you're paying in person. We're, we're going to have a challenge of how do we implement these social distancing measures if over that day, 125 people show up to pay the bill. So that's another aspect of this discussion, just for your information. So, so Sean, uh, Jeanette, may I respond yes. to Sean? So in, in Woodstock, Sean, I live in Woodstock. I'm Allison Clarkson. Hi. Um, yeah. they, they have a box, a locked box in the uh, hall in town hall lobby and you just put your payment into the uh drop lock box and then you uh sign in that you've done it so there's a record of of your having put it in and then you leave yep um sorry for the record this is sean fielder for town of herdwick that is something that we have talked about at this level and uh to be frank, we're pretty concerned that all of a sudden some folks out there in the community are going to figure out that we've got thousands and thousands of dollars in a lockbox. And if we don't do a check on that in the middle of the night, we got a security problem. Right. So that's mm -hmm. been one of the concerns. We do have that capability with Dropbox. Uh, another related issue that we have talked about is, okay, what happens when somebody says, hey, my $2,750 was in there and we count it up and there's only $2,350. You know, we can't count it sitting beside of them. So then we get into that issue. Yeah. Uh, and I don't bring this up to say it can't be done, but these are just some of the logistics that we're starting to see coming at us. Okay. So um, let's... Uh get a sense from here. D committee, did we? We were going to look at kind of um, other issues that are coming up. I, um, Kristen, is it Kristen or Christine? It's Christine, thank you. Christine, okay. Um, did you have issues that you wanted to bring up to us? Um, yeah, I could just a couple of high level Chris, things. Um, just identify yourself for the record, please. Sorry, okay. thanks, yes. I am Christine Lott, Mayor, City of Winooski. Um, I, I wanted to first thank you for, I believe you already passed out, uh, voted out a draft bill for waiving um, penalties and interest on property taxes. We are extending a grace period for payment for our residents. Um, I know you're well aware that we are concerned about the gap that that's going to cause if our residents are paying property taxes later and we don't have the money to um, make the education fund whole to our commitments. Um, so I look forward to seeing the discussion that you have around that in a future meeting. Um, something else that's come up, and I, I'm not certain if you're the right committee for this, but we have been thinking about the, um, the residential training program for uh, police officers for the academy. Um, we are the right committee. We so we are already down um, on our staff. Um, haven't heard word about if there's going to, you know, the spring academy is postponed. Clearly, can't be doing that during social distancing. We haven't heard word on the next iteration, and we think this is a really good opportunity to consider non-residential academy programs so that. We can expand the pool of candidates who can be a part of this and you know free up the ease up on the wait list and get a more diverse um police force available to us um one more one more item that i would mention is um i i, I believe you also have already looked at um evictions moratorium 
And something that we have thought about is, I don't know if this is statewide, but certainly in this area, June 1st is a very common lease date. And we are concerned about non-renewal of leases being used as a way to get around that. Um, so just making sure that people are not being put out into the streets when we likely are still gonna be in some sort of social distancing and, and stay home measure. Yeah, and, and that bill has been passed out of Senate Economic Development. Oh, excellent, thank you. I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> well, anyway, it just, it mostly stays action and, and stays any action on evictions and, and foreclosures, but it doesn't, right. yeah. But our, so and a, a non-renewal of a lease is different than an eviction. Yeah, it, it is, absolutely, and it's different. So does your bill address that? No. That um, might be something that you want, might wanna take back to your committee because that is an issue. It, and it, usually there's a non-renewal for any, I mean, you don't have to have a reason for not renewing a lease where you have to have a reason for evicting someone. Correct. So you might wanna take that back to your committee for more work. This, well, for additional work, yes. Yes. In case we didn't have enough. <laughs> I think it's, Absolutely. Thank you, Christine. Very, very helpful. And thank you, Jeanette. So Christine, the issue of the non-residential academy, we have been pushing that issue for a number of years Long. and uh, we'll continue to push it. Once we get, um, I mean, I think that <coughs> COVID-19 has certainly made it clearer to us that we need to be able to do that. But I think that when we get to the point where we can start addressing issues that aren't specifically related to relief during COVID-19, that that is one of the issues that we will continue to bring up. And there, as you know, there are two two minds of this. There are people who say you have to have it and it has to be residential and build camaraderie and and then there are the people who say, um, you don't have to have that. You can have some, some residential, um, but not 19 weeks, 16 weeks. So, and I think we heard from you before about uh, that you had a couple people who would like to have become police officers. One, I believe was a single mother. That's right. Who, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and, and we've had other candidates who simply can't step away from work for that period of time from their current right. income. Well, so we'll keep pushing on that one. Chris, Christine, Hello. you have a mayor and a manager because I feel like in, in our housing, we had a, somebody testify at Senate Economic Development who was different than you who represented Winooski. Our city manager, Jesse Baker, and she actually- Oh, yes, yeah, yes. she's great. She can okay. speak much more eloquently to the topic of the, the academy. Um, she's very familiar there. Right. Yeah, I've yeah. talked to her and to your police chief about right. that and a couple other, couple other issues. That's it. Jesse testified, right? Yeah. Oh, if I, I could, one more item. Yeah, please. I don't know where the purview is for this, but our food shelf um, is really struggling to acquire toiletries. So they're trying to get, you know, personal hygiene and toilet paper and things like that for um, for families who are not able to use, so these are low-income folks coming in there or people who have lost um, lost work. They are not able to use um, you know, their, their food benefits. Like there's no benefit to cover that. And so now right. we have to provide enough toiletries for these folks um, who need to be able to keep up hygiene during a public health crisis. Hmm. I wonder if any of our um, <clears throat> colleges and schools would have had um, things on hand um, in their bookstores or that could, could I don't know. So, and, and to that end, Christine, um, our food shelf asks all of us when we're traveling to save all our soaps and shampoos and things. Sadly, no one's traveling right now, but that could be a call out into the community mm -hmm. to see who has saved, <laughs> like uh, their, their soaps and shampoos and conditioners in those little things and bring them to the food shelf. 
that's produced a lot actually. And some of us are trying to pressure hotel chains to not do that, but to have dispensers right. instead because you're producing all those little plastic bottles. Yeah. I know but tons of them. But at a moment like this, they're useful because I can give all my Capitol Plaza ones to the food shelf. Do you remember when we, this is an aside, but do you remember when we, um, there was a, a group of people that organized a, a collection for, to send over to Afghanistan? Yes. And um, there were tons of those little ones and little things of toothpaste that were in the, in the boxes. But that could, Christine, that could be a community appeal and I bet you would get a bunch. That's a new angle, thank you. Um, I just thought of two more things um, for some of our vulnerable populations. Um, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont and the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program have mentioned to us, they are trying to assist clients with unemployment insurance claims over the phone and having trouble getting sort of the authority to speak on behalf of their clients. So they're looking for some sort of leniency there as they support those folks. Um, and then also it has been brought to our attention that uh, immigrants without social security numbers are not receiving stimulus or unemployment insurance. I, I know that um, Migrant Justice has spoken with some committee about this, um, just that the, those folks are probably they're likely doing frontline work and you know not receiving any any supports like the rest of our residents. We did um, we heard from migrant justice here also about some of the issues confronting um, the vulnerable communities and and yesterday um, I believe it was on an all these meetings run together. It was either on an all senate meeting or a chairs meeting. We talked about the. Um, bill that's being proposed for essential workers, the, the frontline people who are getting paid. This is because they're not eligible for unemployment. So people who are getting unemployment are actually getting more money than those frontline workers are because they're making like $12, $15 an hour. And the undocumented migrant um, dairy workers, and there are probably other people also, can't be included in that. But so the appropriations committee is trying to figure out a different way of approaching that because we know that those are essential workers and um, we need to we need to be honoring them also. So so Jeanette, then, uh, yeah. Christine, I'm going to take the issue of people speaking on behalf of, of a client or a um, another person to our Senate Economic Development Committee, which I'm vice chair of and. Uh, because we do all the UI stuff, um, this strikes me as a just a, a, a strong letter that we could send to Commissioner Harrington uh, recommending this. So thanks for yeah. that. <clears throat> Thank you all for um, for hearing from me and for the work that you're doing to push these issues forward. Well, we hope we hope we can push some more forward. So, are there other issues, or can we um, talk a little bit more about the quasi judicial boards? I'd like to get just a little bit more information on them, and then if if we if other issues come up, we'll we'll just do the whole thing on Tuesday, and then um, Chris. Uh, I have a question for the mayor. Um, sure. When you were referring to the inability to use um, what you were talking about, SNAP, like an EBT card for SNAP benefits uh, being restricted, you can't buy personal hygiene products with it. Right. Yes, that's what I'm told by okay. um, our food chefs. I want to make sure it was like the snap card or something. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, other issues or other things that we should um, talk about? And I, I guess... I have, okay. Senator White, okay. I had a couple of other things from the town of Hardwick. Is that okay? Oh, that's what we're here for. Okay. Um, I, um, I had provided, uh, again, Sean Fielder, uh, town manager with mm -hmm. the town of Hardwick for the record. Um, I had provided a written statement to Gail, but um, I was behind the curve in that I want to say thank you also. I understand that the uh, committee did move forward the uh, 
waive the the local legislative bodies uh, capability to waive uh, or change due dates on property taxes, reduce or waive penalties and interest um, and uh, late fees for uh, municipal property taxes owed by the property uh, taxpayer. So I want to say thank you on behalf of Town of Hardwick. Our select board um, did talk about this particular issue over the last two meetings. Uh, if I have my information correct, uh, we at this time um, don't necessarily have anything in regards to uh, if the town property tax returns or city property tax returns come up short, uh, we're still obligated to pay our education bill to our elementary and our high school union district. And if I see uh, information from the league being accurate here, uh, my understanding is this is going to be moved or being taken up by the Senate Finance uh, House Ways and Means Committee. Um, we would, the town of uh, Hardwick would like to see it that in the event, uh, you know, I'll use our town as an example here really quickly. We have a property tax due date um, uh, before knowing this information, our property tax due date is May 10. We don't anticipate changing this due date at this time. We are uh, at this time, we're owed about two point. Uh, eight million dollars in property tax returns uh, on or before may 10th our education bill that we've got to pay to our school districts is 2.6 million we uh obviously uh we closed out our third year uh sorry third quarter fiscal budget pretty uh, it was okay um but we're really concerned where's this fourth quarter going to close out particularly with what's owed on our property tax return so it's right. excellent that we have the opportunity to make an extension but we're really worried if we're significantly short we're going to have to dig into our reserves uh and or borrow to cover this this hole and that's really going to put the town at a disadvantage for our financial operations um you know, we would like to see that the state uh, potentially take this on and uh, take on that borrowing capacity on behalf of all the communities in the state, if that's an opportunity. So um, that I understand may be taken up by other committees. So I can coordinate with uh, Karen and Gwen if I need to provide anything more to those committees. Um, we uh, just a couple of details. I already mentioned that, you know, we've been trying to evaluate. We had early on evaluated at the town level. Can we make an adjustment on our due date of our property tax? And we had already set that. Uh, so uh, and mailed that property tax bill out because the secretary of state had been recommending don't conduct any votes at this time. We decided it wouldn't make sense to go and make an adjustment. So uh, us, at least at the local level, being able to waive some penalties and fees is good. We do and have done this for some time in the town of Hardwick. We offer up contract opportunities for somebody that is not in a, in a position to pay their property tax bill. So we are, uh, we anticipate some folks having trouble uh, moving forward. Uh, I think everybody's aware, you know, the unemployment rate we're seeing is unprecedented for a generation or more. We know of a number of businesses in the town of Hardwick that they are not operating right now. So uh, as you can imagine, we got some pretty significant concerns mm -hmm. what's going to happen moving forward here. Um, if we can continue to offer these contracts and we basically enter us into a six month contract with folks, if we cannot uh, penalize them at this phase, and, and here's what I mean to say, if it's a certain amount owed and we don't have to assign this 8% penalty and then the monthly interest, you know, at the local level, now we can waive that. If we can now work it up the line so that the, uh, you know, the town is not facing a penalty in case we come up short, that would be the ideal situation from our perspective. So uh, if there's anything that can be done to advance that, I think it would be really valuable. Um, you're gonna see the uh, test, uh, uh, go ahead. Wait. Allison, let him finish. Okay. No, if you'd like me to answer a question, why don't you go ahead? No, no, I'd like you to finish um, and then we can ask some general questions. Okay, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm adjusting on the fly because my apologies, I was behind the curve on what the League of Cities okay. and Towns had put out in regards to some changes and uh, this is not an excuse, but I think we're all in the same boat. I'm, my bandwidth is a little bit limited these days trying to keep up. So forgive me, I'm a little bit behind on a certain aspect of this being passed out. So I appreciate that. Um, just a, a little bit, we talked about cash for the property tax return. The other, the other angle for us at the town level is the town manager's office makes a determination what kind of contracts we will enter into. Right now, I'm the only one that is reporting to the town manager's office. You know, we have my financial manager and my um, HR manager uh, working from home right now. So uh, the way it works for us in town is, yeah, we have the capability to now make an adjustment, uh, assuming the legislature goes forward with this on waiving these penalties and fees. 
this is going to be a good thing because now I can say to my property taxpayers, uh, if you're facing a hardship situation, the property taxpayers, excuse me, if uh, you're facing a hardship situation, why don't you wait until the first week of June and then we will go forward with getting a contract set up with you and you can get this addressed over the next six months. Without this, uh, people will likely be hollering at my office to say, I need to be in there and meet with somebody about setting up a contract. And the fact of the matter is the social distancing measures are going to be here for some time. So uh, my HR manager is the one that does this. Uh, and you know, she's got a young baby at home. I don't want to put her in a situation where she potentially is being exposed, if that makes sense. So, yep. uh, you know, us having some flexibility on these things is going to be extremely valuable. We're trying to balance this, uh, I'll call it a soft open right now. Uh, as an example, our town clerk's office now is doing limited appointments based on uh, what Governor Scott had released last Friday about, okay, you can start to ramp some things back up in regards to uh, things like title searches, um, you know, some of these other issues that all of you are familiar with. But as you can imagine, you know, it's from some customer's perspective, when they hear information like this, they think, okay, we're right back to 100% of operations. And I literally had to do a post last week in consultation with my town clerk to put up on Front Porch Forum and put up on our website. We are holding to our no public access uh, until May 15th with certain mm -hmm. exceptions. And that's going to be determined by the department. In this instance, the context with the town clerk's office. So, um, you know, there, there's some pretty significant things that are coming up that just none of us expected and we're having to adapt on the fly. So um, uh, just, just, just putting out there that there's these small things that come up that you think on face value wouldn't be that too big a deal to figure out, but it causes some uh, angst and fr frustration on both sides of the table, I guess is how I would say it. The tactic here from the town of Hardwick, and I think this is many other municipalities and businesses tactic, well, I don't know if it's everybody's, but the tactic we're taking is we're erring on the side of caution. And, um, you know, we're just trying to have, we're, we're trying to tell, let me, let me bring it back around to some of these folks that are paying, you know, they want to pay their property tax bill in cash. By law, we're obligated to receive that payment uh, in a cash format. But what we're doing is just, you know, asking and respectfully saying, please, if you're in a position to pay by check or money order, please do that. Unfortunately, just about the time the COVID-19 situation was uh, rearing its head, we were actually looking at getting ourselves in a position to receive cash pay, uh, check, uh, excuse me, credit card or uh, PayPal payments. But with everything happening, that process got on hold. So that would obviously be one of your questions. Can you receive via credit card payment? The answer for us is no. Um, um, so, um, you know, uh, related to uh, revenue shortfalls, the other thing is coming up for our community. Um, let me just state this. We've been lucky enough that we haven't had to do any furloughs or any layoffs. We've had a pretty tight and frugal budget for years. So we're very lucky in that respect. We don't know how it's going to go moving forward. Um, uh, you know, hopefully we can get these returns in and, and we go from there. Um, we also, uh, we do have public water and wastewater service. We have quarterly bills due on that May 15th. This isn't having to do with the property tax returns, but we're anticipating that some folks are gonna potentially have a problem paying those bills as well. So we're trying to figure out, okay, how's this also impact these enterprise funds where the fees are gonna be down? Uh, just a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, before I forget, I uh, appreciate the uh, mayor's comment about, you know, if there's a way we can maybe flex on police officers and uh, maybe use an out-of-state academy as a, an allowed requirement, uh, that would be good for the town of Hardwick. I know there's a number of municipalities and agencies who are having a really hard time finding officers right now. We're one officer down. We were about to make an offer to an officer to fill a position. They were anticipating going to the August Academy and uh, coronavirus crept in there. So that's been on hold. So, you know, if we could get ourselves in a position and maybe have that as an opportunity, I think it would be valuable. Uh, you know, one of the things that's happening, and this is separate from uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 outbreak that you all need to be aware of, and maybe you are, but uh, if you're not, um, one of the things we're seeing is we're having to do, uh, we're having to compete with other departments who are offering signing bonuses that municipalities and towns can't come close to offering. Uh, as an example, a, a nearby agency is offered a $15,000 signing bonus for who, officers. Who did? Uh, is it okay? Uh, one of the uh, county sheriff's departments. I won't mention the name. 
So, um, you know, that, and that's their prerogative. They're, you know, they're, they're an independent enterprise. They can do that. But uh, the point is we're just, we're not in a position to be able to do a signing bonus like that. Well, we do try to, we do have a very good workplace and, you know, do our best to offer a good benefits package, but that's definitely a challenge that uh, we're into. Um, I, I don't need to go on and on. I've offered a couple of things here. I just want to say thank you to the committee and I appreciate all your good work. I mean, all of us are dealing with issues that none of us would have expected two months ago. And I know you've been uh, extremely busy on things and, uh, you know, from the municipalities perspective and the town of Hardwick appreciate everything that you're working on, try to make it easier and better for us out here on the, you know, at the local level. So thank you. I'd be glad to, glad to answer any questions you might have. Allison, you had a question? You said, what could you do to advance the conversation about the town state uh, penalty situation? You can be in touch with the, with the entire committee of Senate finance and the entire committee of House Ways yeah. and Means and let them know how important this is. Thank Brian. you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Sean, I'm, I'm happy that you indicated that you had the knowledge about the impact of potentially delaying your due date and having it intersect with the state's due date for their money, because that was one of the, not objections, but one of the points that was raised in an all Senate caucus when we began talking about uh, our belief that the local legislative body should have that option. The towns and cities do now, as you know, but they can't have an all town meeting. So this seemed to be a reasonable uh, way to do it. So thank you for being aware of that because that was one of the issues that was raised was do the towns really understand that on June 1st, they're still gonna owe the money to the state. There's no doubt about that. And so by saying that you uh, potentially are gonna not take advantage of that, you know, moving your own date, that that's good to hear, although it doesn't help you at all. My other question was um, if you do, change the 8%, how do you pay your tax collector there? <laughs> I'm the tax collector and there's no discharge right. fee. It's part of okay. my salary. <laughs> okay, so no, some municipalities so, do have them yeah, on salary no, and yeah, some use the 8%, stipend. so, okay. Yeah, that's correct. That's an actual stipend position. I'm aware of that. In the town of Hardwick, that would not be a pertinent issue. There's no additional there. Okay, thank you. The way that we're thinking about this issue is just real quick, if you allow me, um, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, we do have a certain percentage of uh, payers that do enter into a contract with us. And in the past, we have assigned this penalty and in interest. The way we're thinking about it now is with this new economy that we're in, we didn't want to see it's a double jeopardy situation is the basic comment. You know, if anything we do to try to help people so they're not going to lose their homes, that's important is our perspective. So I know this is um, probably heresy, but I, I will, every time we talk with municipalities or anybody about property tax, what we say is we need to keep the education fund whole. And I understand that, but there are not any, in my opinion, there are probably not any funds that are going to be kept whole throughout this um, crisis that we're facing. I, the, the transportation fund is not going to be kept whole. So at some point, the transportation fund sends money to municipalities for um, local, for road maintenance. And that might be down. I mean, we don't know what's going to affect most of the funds, but we always, always, always talk about keeping the education fund whole. And um, I think that's a conversation. It's a larger conversation, but I think we need to have, have that. So I know that sounds like heresy, but I think it, it needs to be put out there. Senator White, could I ask Chris, a clarifying question? A yes. Um, what, what, I'm, uh, what I had mentioned, and uh, if I look at what's being pushed along to the uh, Senate Finance uh, and House uh, Ways and Means Committee, um, what we're, what, uh, the town's a position is this, let me start over. What we're trying to do is if we come up significantly short, we understand we have to pay this bill. We, we got that. 
but we're trying to figure out and, and, and maybe you said this and I'm just uh, not getting it. So I'll just, uh, I'm going to read it back this way. What we're trying to figure out is instead of the town having to dig into our limited reserves and or borrow on the market, is there a way that the state could uh, assist in that borrowing capacity, if that makes oh. sense? No, yep. I, I understand that. We My question you. is a is a larger one about the education fund itself and about yeah. how the we have based the education fund a lot on property taxes and is that the right way to do it and is our education fund the proper fund i, I mean i is it at the proper level and all all revenues and all funds will be hurt through this and that might end up being one of the ones that is hurt as are others that that it's a larger question. It isn't. It certainly isn't going to be answered within the next couple of weeks. And I, I know there are a lot of people who would probably um, put a sock in my mouth right now, but so be it. I'm not. I'm not going to put a sock in your mouth. But that that integrity of the the Ed Fund was part of a quid pro quo with Act 60 and 68. Is that before that, the Ed Fund had often been uh, borrowed for, you know, there were issues with it, money leaving for different reasons. And the, the, the promise was maintaining the integrity of the Ed Fund at that point. And I, I, I think it goes just back to that, why people yeah. talk about keeping it whole. It's like a promise that your tax dollars won't be siphoned off for any other purpose. That's, I think, where it comes from. I get, I get that. And um I, I, I get that. I just think it's a conversation we need to have about how the I, Ed Fund is funded and is property, is the huge reliance on property tax the appropriate place because that, so anyway, it's a, it's a larger conversation, I know, and I probably shouldn't even have brought it up. It, it may be, it may be heresy, but we count on you to bring up heresies from time to time, you know, as chair. <laughs> okay, I'm always willing to be the one that gets slapped down. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any other questions or anything here that we need to any other questions for anybody Gwen Karen um Tucker I see is with us um anybody so we, else yeah any other towns I mean 251 towns I mean we have two what terrific spokespeople but any nobody else well we've got well I, Senator, I you have can bring in a parade of towns if you no, like. <laughs> I, I don't think we need that. I think well, that's good. Um, <laughs> Anthony, did you want a parade? No, I said we're good. <laughs> they have two very good this representatives is, here with us yes. all the time. So this is Gwen Zakoff again. I just we we were under the you know umbrella of that um the COVID-19 centric legislation was moving forward. So that's sort of how we um, positioned yeah. this sort of discussion. And um, to address Senator Clarkson's point about like, you know, things to look towards in the future. I mean, we're doing like everybody's doing, I'm assuming a lot of issue spotting along the way of sort of lessons to be learned that were obviously kind of like holding in our back pocket um, pretty openly, I guess, um, <laughs> Um, for even right. small things like how you do payments, you know, whether it's credit card or whatnot. And, and right now in statute, uh, different officials have different powers over who decides what type of payments are made and in what form, which is like walking in. Uh, the example is like walking into a Walmart or a supermarket and paying cash at the deli and paying credit card <laughs> at the produce section or whatever. So it doesn't make any sense. So we're learning, these are things that have kind of been in, in play for a while, but they're really being highlighted now, just like the, you know, the deeds and titles and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, we're paying attention to all those issues um, and, and keeping sort of a, a, a formal and less formal list um, and paying attention to what our, you know, towns are saying, but we wanted to sort of keep um, uh, on the COVID-19 kind of issues um, yeah, as directed. Yeah, if I could just add to that, um, and, th and this is not in your committee, but we have written to both the appropriations committees, and particularly in light of the fact that the most recent aid package from the federal government does not contain any um, assistance for local governments, that um, it's, we, we are going to have um, needs 
for uh, replacing lost revenue or covering some of the costs that are being incurred at the local level. And we're going to need help from the um, state and from the appropriations committees on that front. We don't have a number yet. It's going to be kind of hard to get a number, um, same as with the state budget, but that's definitely a major ask that we have. Right. That's, that's clear that that's coming down the pike. The U.S. And Senate I, would just say you should go bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, uh, we Senate. heard that. Yeah. We heard that. Actually, we need your permission in order to go bankrupt. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know about that one. We need our permission for everything. Yes. Yes, we do. So uh, this is Sean with the town of Hardwick on that last issue. Uh, this came up when the Family First Coronavirus Care Act, if I have that right, first came out. We didn't know at that time if, uh, okay, for our employees, uh, if we want to consider, uh, you know, uh, some of our essential employees, if we wanted to consider doing an on-call work situation, uh, as an example with our highway department. Uh, we were evaluating that, and the route we took was we kept to the schedule to the best of our ability and did the social distancing, and you know we're doing our best to uh, protect the workers while still getting those essential tasks done. It would have been nice if uh, through that act, and it's just what Karen has outlined, the municipalities also would have gotten a little bit of reimbursement because I think what it would have really, really been valuable for us uh, was okay we we can go to a little bit of an on-call situation and rotate some schedules and uh, and and be covered uh, you know made whole financially or at least a good portion of that why this would have been important for us is the the anxiety levels um, for workers who are uh, I mean we're not like in the hospital but there still is that anxiety of you know I'm out and about and working so certain employees obviously get pretty concerned about that and and it's been a hot button issue I've been dealing with quite a bit this last three or four week period um, you know with our uh, you know with our employees uh, across the board they're just anxious about okay if I'm in this work environment what are the you know what are the ramifications you know we knock on wood and, and thank god we haven't had an incident as of yet and hopefully we keep it that way but uh if if i had my preference looking back and i would have known i could have gotten some financial reimbursement through this act i maybe would have done a cycle of on-call approach and i think that would have been really valuable well if centered government operations was ruling the world we would have done a lot of things differently. Senator Colmore, did you have something you wanted to throw in? I would only offer, I thought I heard that if there's going to be, let's say the fourth one is the one that just was passed yesterday by the US House, I believe. And I think will be signed today by the president and begin to uh, get distributed. And that has money for the PPP and for hospitals and for mm -hmm. testing and some other things. But I don't believe there was anything in uh, there which included municipalities. But I thought I heard uh, Congressman Welch say today that there's a fifth potential bill coming that will include some funding for municipalities. Um, yeah, I think that, that this is Karen. Yeah, oh, this is Go ahead. Karen Horn. And that is the case that the legislation they passed last evening does not include any aid. The um, House is interested in um, providing direct aid to um, local governments, but it's going to be a, a very, um, it's going to be a huge partisan fight because mm -hmm. uh, as, as Senator Polina said, Mitch McConnell yeah, me, Senator McConnell says, go bankrupt. I yep. mean, he's, he's holding the position that they don't, towns don't need any assistance. Well, it, isn't it all about the pensions for Mitch McConnell? I don't no. know what he thinks. He's uh, using I, I that as an excuse, I think. I think that right. it's, I, I think it's a, a bigger issue. And I, I will say, I, I will say that what's been really interesting in the last, uh, few weeks is that across the country, even in the most conservative senatorial districts, local governments are saying, we need help. Yes. So, um, 
anyway, that's a huge other discussion. I'm sorry to take you down that rabbit hole. Well, that's my fault, uh, Karen. I, I apologize for even bringing it up. I didn't mean to insert any uh, partisan division in what has no. been a very nonpartisan uh, process. So I forgive me. And I, I think that, I think that there it, at at the very highest levels there are there it probably is seen as a partisan thing. But I think that if you go start down with the municipalities and go through the states and the governors and and um, many House members and and many senators are not seeing this as a partisan issue at all. I think it's the um, the to be blunt, I think it's the president and the um, leaders, the legislative leaders that are seeing it as partisan, but yeah, I, I may be wrong. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Okay. I have a so for, um, Gwen or Karen. So the, this is Sean. Of wait, Sorry. wait, uh, Chris Bray has a question here. Yes. On methods of payment, um, are there electronic means available to cities and towns that don't have a fee associated with them. I mean, if I can imagine, you know, the normal credit card processing fee would be pretty devastating if it was applied to your grand list, you know, uh, tax roll, something like that. Are there low or no interest electronic processing systems available to municipalities? Um, I believe that part of the reluctance for um, some municipalities to go to credit card payments is, is the fee that is charged. Um, I don't know, uh, Sean mentioned PayPal. There's probably, there's a fee. I think there's a fee attached to almost everything, but um, not, not particular consideration to, to cities and towns in reduced fees. Well, okay. So maybe there's an opportunity there for a credit union to offer within Vermont municipalities to process the ability to process their, their payments for little or no money. Because you're reminding me actually, I got a I got a letter from the Chamber of Commerce. I think this must be the local one, complaining about how everybody's using charge cards now for everything and nobody wants to handle cash and that the credit card companies are making a windfall off of these fees. And they were wondering if there's something we could do with it about it as a legislature to make them reduce the fees or not take advantage of the situation. I, I'd kind of forgotten about that, so I'll, I'll bring that up again when I get a chance. State Bank. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> Could I, uh, this is Sean Fielder from Herdwick. Could I just offer a quick comment? Yeah, please. Um, you know, we obviously know we've got uh, things um, uh, at the uh, national legislative level, both in the executive and legislative branch that could impact us positively or could impact us negatively at the town and municipal level. And um, I, I don't wanna project here, we're whining and you know, needing more. What we're trying to do here in the town of Hardwick, and I believe this is the case across the state, we're doing our best just to deal with the situation at hand. And uh, you know that's why you know what led up with hey can can the state consider waiving some of these fees? So you know here we are talking about a credit card fee, and it ties right back to this you know part of this initial discussion. I appreciate that the you know your committee uh, this committee advanced hey at the local level you have the opportunity to waive some of these fees so we get at least a little bit of a timeout to try to get some solutions in place to keep the ball rolling. I mean the. Uh, the action items that are coming up, and I know you all are experiencing this, they're things that are just, we never would have expected this. So uh, not a complaint, but you know, we're trying to handle these high level um, decision making actions. And then on the same, you know, in the same day, uh, you know, we have to deal with, here's new guidance, you know, that we have to follow in regards to practicing our social distancing. So anything that we can be doing right at our level and try to make a change I appreciate. And that's what we're trying to do here. And you know, anything you all can be doing to uh, advance our cause and support it is very much appreciated. Well, I don't think, I don't think you should perceive it as we think you're complaining. We just think you're updating us on what, you, what the reality is out there in the community. So it's, yeah. you know, I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. And we did as a committee sent um, a letter to uh, finance, um, encouraging them to think about the 8% penalty. It isn't our decision to make, it's theirs, but we did 
um, encourage them to reconsider that penalty. The due dates, I don't know if they can reconsider, but the penalty, they, they certainly can. So we're encouraging Thank that, you. but it isn't our decision. So yeah, understood. So are, if there are other, not other issues right now from municipalities, um, I, on Tuesday, I think what we'll do is uh, the quasi-judicial um, meetings, the municipal boards that have to meet, get more information on that. And um, and I, I, it might be um, that they might be in a position to talk about elections then, I'm not sure, but um, I'll think I'll know that more of that by Monday and we can set an agenda. Does that work for people? If we do it that way and not set an agenda right now. Sure. So what we, okay, so, but what we do have to do today is Tucker is here with us to, we need to finally pass the version of the posting bill. So Tucker, if you could help us with that. Yes, Madam Chair. And uh, I emailed out to the committee earlier mm -hmm. today and I believe Gail has posted version yeah. 2.1 mm -hmm. of uh, the bill. And the changes that were made yesterday in committee were first to remove section two uh, that related to, excuse me, uh, the non-posting issues, uh, the quasi-judicial proceeding issues. Mm -hmm. um, and second, to add a clause that would make it clear to the municipalities that they could use a combination of electronic and physical locations if that is how they wanted to proceed. So the language that I will point you to uh, starts on line 15 and the clause now reads, a municipal public body may post any meeting agenda or notice of a special meeting in two designated electronic locations in lieu of the two designated public places in the municipality. And here's the clause that you asked for or in a combination of a designated electronic location and a designated public place. So uh, the language you discussed yesterday was much simpler. However, when I went in to revise uh, that particular sentence to add the language that said, or any combination thereof, I realized that that would actually imply that they had to use two electronic locations and two physical yeah. locations. <laughs> this language was necessary to make it clear that it would be two total a combination of electronic and physical if that's how they choose to proceed. So are there any questions on that or just that, is that, yes, Brian? Sucker on line 20, I'm just noticing, and forgive me if I didn't see this earlier, it says that the notice should be posted or the agenda in or near the municipal clerk's office. What exactly, why are we doing the near part? That's the language that is used in the open meeting law. Okay. Uh, so that's Fine. an underlying requirement. Enough said. Fine. As far Enough. as the near part, my assumption is that's a posting board. Okay. Yeah. Not always that's fine. in the building. Yeah. I think that some towns have different configurations of their where their clerk's office is. And um, for example, in Brattleboro in their, they have their clerk's office is in the municipal building, but they have a, um, a bulletin board. They might post it on the bulletin board okay. at the town hall instead of on the office door. That's okay. what I think. Yep. So are we okay with this committee? Sure. Any more questions, comments? Uh, Brian? I, I, I'm ready to make a motion. Oh, okay. Go oh. ahead. Were you ready to make a motion? Indeed, I was, uh, Senator, but that's fine. You can go ahead. And perhaps no, she you can. can't because she has to answer her phone. She's busy. I don't. I don't. I'd, I'd make a motion that we uh, amend uh, drafting request 20 0966 with draft 2.1. Okay. Yes. Any more discussion? All right. Nope. Are you ready to call the roll? I am ready. 
Senator Bray. Yes. It's amazing. I can hear you all the way from Addison County. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Senator Collimore. Yes. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Great. And uh, I'd now make a motion that we adopt uh, <coughs> drafting request 20-0966 as amended by draft 2.1. And Bray. Yes. Clarkson. Yes. Palmore. Yes. Polina. Yes. And White. Yes. Great. So I... I um, will report the property tax bill. I am used to answering questions. I'm hoping there's no questions asked, but I'll report that. Senator Colmer, would you like to report this one? Sure. Okay. Unless somebody else wants to. That's good. Tucker? Did Tucker, you want, you want to, to report this bill? one? Uh, I have no interest. No, uh, <laughs> I also don't have the capacity. I just wanted to check in to see whether these were going to be introduced as separate committee bills or whether they're going to be combined so that I can coordinate with the Senate secretary. My understanding from this morning is that they, there will be two bills. Okay, thank you. Oh, you had your chairs meeting this morning. Yes. How'd that go? Like a chairs meeting. It was good, it was good. <laughs> um, yeah. Tucker, will you be able to just shoot me a quick, um, it's a floor report, but it really doesn't need to be very complicated. Sure, which bill are you reporting? The, the one we just voted bill. on. Okay, yes, I can do that. And, and, and the, I believe, um, Senator Collimore, that what the clean copy will have to come from you to Secretary Bloomer's office because you're the reporter. So it'll have to come from you with a report of the vote. Okay. So and then Tucker will I don't know. forward it to me and then I'll forward it to, to John Bloomer. You're still you're, you're muted. Tucker. You were muted. You're still muted. That, that was intentional. My wife was answering her phone. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were saying something to us. Uh, from what I understand, the reporter of the bill delivers it to the Senate Secretary. Madam Chair, you have to send an email to drafting operations approving both bills. And I okay. also apparently have to do that, which is why I was asking how many bills we were gonna have. So how do I send a bill to drafting operations? Who is that? Is that Nadine? Yes, and if you would like, when I send my approval, I'll CC you so that you can just follow up on those. Perfect, perfect. Okay. And then when I get it, I'll forward it to John Bloomer. Yeah. And then I need a clean copy also for our records. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? No. Nope. That we should address today that we might want to. Um, so I we will plan on meeting on Tuesday, and if. <coughs> I would like us to finish up with the quasi board issue, uh, uh, quasi judicial board issue, so that we can make sure that we have that ready for the next time there's a floor session. And I don't know if there'll be a floor session at the end of next week, or it'll have to be until the next week. I, I don't know that at all. Um, and I don't think there are any other um, municipal issues that we need to make sure we get in there. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. I, I just wanna make sure that when we do the, uh, the meeting situation with the, with the quasi, that, that we had also had something in about inspecting um, and that we hear from some listeners yes. or someone like that. Yes, and I, said, down. and I think that, uh, Either Gwyn or Karen this morning said that um, John Gannon has some information about that. And maybe okay. we would add, we could either do this as a, we're thinking about doing a joint committee for the, on the municipal elections that the Secretary of State is um, 
proposing and then um, hearing an update on the state and federal elections from them. So if they're ready for that on Tuesday, we could do that on Tuesday, but I think we would also have time to, to do the quasi um, judicial boards on Tuesday. So I'd like to get that done. If we don't, if the elections people aren't ready on Tuesday, we'll do that later in the week. But I'd like to get the quasi judicial boards done, I think. So we'll, uh, Senator, Mr. yeah. Gwen? Senator, wait, this is Gwen Duckoff. I just, um, last, oh God, it must have been yesterday when I brought up the uh, VALA, the listers and assessors. I also think it would be important um, for the committee to reach out to Jill Remick at PVR, oh. at the Department of yeah. Taxes, because she, they've been putting out guidance to municipalities about this very issue. Um, so she'd be able to fill in sort of the, um, the nuances okay. about um, how they're trying to approach this, um, this issue. Okay. All right. So let's let's look at those two issues, and we'll do the um, the elections thing on either Thursday or Friday of next week. We'll do that. Right. Okay. Just the two, the just the municipal issues on Tuesday. And okay. anything further that we're thinking on vulnerable communities and stuff. So, uh, I will take the issue of the. Um, people working on behalf of people who don't speak uh, English yet well enough to deal with UI. I'll take that to Senate Economic Development. Anything else that we want to work on legislatively on our vulnerable communities issues? Well, we did, um, I think it was at the chair's meeting that I brought up the issue of the undocumented farm workers in particular that aren't mm -hmm. eligible for really anything and they don't get paid sick days and they have cramped quarters if they have to quarantine they don't so they're really at a huge disadvantage here on almost everything and and jane um said they could not include them in the essential workers bill that we're going to be looking at soon but um they are going to try and figure out a way of making keeping them going and yeah we, we met with them. We met with them a couple of times in the, in the agriculture committee and they talked about two proposals, one in New Jersey and one in California where the state had found a way to try to give them some financial support. And the ag committee is thinking about trying to do something similar. It would still go through appropriations, obviously. I don't know whether Bobby would have been at the, well, you were at a chair's meeting. But I don't know if Bobby mm -hmm. brought it up, but the idea that we have to find some way to separately to find a way to help them with their financial troubles. So, yeah, and and so Go Anthony ahead. and Brian, um, they are most of those <clears throat> um, migrant workers uh, in in agriculture are still, I hope, being paid. I mean, they're still working uh, on these farms, yeah. Uh, so they're still being paid. Um, and okay, so that that hasn't yet been uh, uh, an issue, although they are on the sort of front lines, as it were, providing food for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, they they're also should. talking. They're also talking about supplies, like gloves that they need to change more often, stuff, like, and also some of their housing issues. It wasn't necessarily. It wasn't always about pay, but it was about other issues that they have that require financial help in order right. to and be able to survive. Remote education was a big deal when they yeah, talked to us. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. see right. that. And, yeah. Jeanette, I wanted to ask you about. You talk about this elections thing that you're mentioning. Is that, are we talking about the upcoming uh, uh, primary and general election? Is that what they're working on? Yeah, <laughs> what we talked about this morning was, so there are two different things here. There's municipal elections and how um, particularly towns who don't have budgets and school districts who don't have budgets, how they're going to conduct their elections. Right. So the secretary of state's office has come up with some guidelines for the municipalities and they were proposing that working with the governor and the governor was reviewing them um, to make sure that, because in our legislation, you know, we said that there had to be agreement between the secretary of state and the, and the administration. Right. But we so, don't have to approve that stuff. No, but it would be good for us to hear. Sure, sure, no, that's, a, I, it, but, but, it, but it's um, not up to us anymore. No, but no. these are coming up fairly quickly with many of uh, municipalities. 
Sure, but it's not. It's up to us to understand it and be supportive of it. But we don't need to approve right. it. We don't like, have to take because that. we've already given them the power to decide. There might be a couple things in there that we have to that might need some legislative um, fixes, like the thing that Gwyn um, brought up about the um, <clears throat> uh, petitions. And right. so we we might need to do something, but, but we don't know yet until we see what the Secretary of State's um, proposal is. And then, then there's a second, and that, that would answer any questions for municipalities. Then there's the second um, election, elections issue, which is the primary and the general election. And that yeah. they are, um, they have draft proposals and they're still working with the governor to try and figure out. And, um, but, and for us, when we deal with elections all the time, we have a better understanding of how long it takes to, I mean, when decisions have to make, it's um, Chris Bray's analogy of the plane taking off at the, they need to know what that date is when they are gonna decide whether they're gonna lift up or not. So the it's harder for people who are not, uh, involved in elections every day and don't deal with it um, all the time to, to figure out that you need all that advance um, uh, planning. And the, there was some suggestion that they should wait until after the primary to figure out how we were gonna do the general election. Oh, really? and, <laughs> but but if, you're not, if you're not immersed in elections, you wouldn't know that that would be a problem. It, it makes sense to to do that. So they're working um, with the governor on that, and there may be a few things in there that um, <clears throat> that we might have input on. And um, just for your information, the we received money from Hava that should cover. Um, it came yesterday. That should cover all of the um, elections issues that we will need for next year. And what's for this election? What's HAVA? Huh? What's HAVA? Help America Vote Act. Oh, Help oh, America, America Vote America Act. Vote. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I never think of it as HAVA. Right. So, so there are some things that I think we might want input on here in terms of the election, the general and the primary election, just to hear from them. That's why we're, looking at it sure. but yes legislatively there's nothing to do we've already done that right. um when you say that um Jeanette, it makes me think of um it, the, the window for voting is starts 45 days before the right election date right so i think that's like one of those things people don't think about that how close those votes actually the first day of voting actually is you know and it's, it's the gaps are way smaller than people think. Like and if you're going to mail a ballot to everybody, right. that's a lot of extra postage, printing, mailing it out, having it mailed back. How are you going to have it uh, come back? Um, and they are do, talking about possibly two different mailings. One that uh, mails to everybody saying, request your absentee ballot, your early voting ballot now. And the, so they're talking about a number of um, mailings, some mailings to, when we heard from, um, I don't remember who Susanna or Mark Hughes who brought up the issue of doing some kind of a mailing to everybody in the state saying, this election is gonna be different. You need to know that it's gonna be different. And so they're aware of it. So it, all of a sudden the election is not different and people didn't know. So. <clears throat> they're gonna they're doing all of that kind of stuff and they need to do it early right you know that first notice mailing when they there'll be plenty of things that will get bounced back to them you know anytime you mail you find out how many bad addresses you have and it's challenging yeah well i think they're thinking about the the informational piece just going to every right every household however you do that and then the other one going to 
registered voters. Right, right. Yeah, like so, every door direct mail, you can get every yeah. address. Yeah. So um, we'll try and get next week's schedule done. Are there any more questions or issues or things we need to address or anybody have any parting words of wisdom or non-wisdom for us? All set. Tomorrow's you supposed gotta to be do, You got to go do some shoveling. I do have to go do some more shoveling, although it's kind of rainy here today. So, oh. yeah, I've, I've, lo I've moved about six or seven wheelbarrows full so far. Good work. I, yeah. We're going to be evaluating you for a non-point discharge, so be careful. <laughs> it's all composted. Right, we know what it is. I just don't want to come down there and see any chickens walking around on it. <laughs> oh, right. oh, oh, wait we a minute. Passed that yet. We have see, chickens Monday. at both ends. Oh, that's right, you can have chickens on it, I forgot. We have chickens at both ends of our road that just run across the street all the time. Feral, well, if you move fast, people. that's dinner if you hit one. I mean, you know, that's dinner. I bet you're good at plucking too. No, but I'll tell you what I was good at. I am good at plucking, but what I was good at was when we lived in, when we were in, when we were Vista volunteers, we lived in Gainesville, Georgia, which is the poultry capital of the world. And we lived right near all the poultry factories. Oh, lucky. And, the, and the neighborhood, they would come through with these um, crates on the trucks yeah. and each crate had about 10 chickens in it and they would whip around the corners and the crate would fall off and the neighborhood kids showed us how to be very stealth and catch the chickens so we became very good at going out and getting behind a car and catching a chicken as it came off the truck <laughs> we won't tell yeah. Oh, the world Goodbye. knows it now. <laughs> Thanks for letting me. Thanks for letting me comment to the committee.